Hey guys, Jacob here. Um, so we are back at doing a crave again from Kevin's office. Uh, I'm going to lead us in a few songs of worship. We'll pray and then um, Kevin will come up and we'll talk about some more stuff. So uh, just sit back or stand up however you want to worship at home and we hope you guys enjoy. Stands, great is your faithfulness. Faithful. 
faithfulness still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail me yet I know the night won't last Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Jesus, you're still in Your love, oh, my heart will sing your praise again. The promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence, you'll never fail me yet, never fail me yet. I've seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe I see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way, and I believe I see you do it again. I've seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe I see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way, and I believe. I see you do it again. I see you do it again. Oh, you move again. Oh. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. Never fail me yet. Never fail me. God be in this room today, be in everyone's room where they're at. Help them to hear you. God, we thank you for the ability to connect with each other in this day and age. We count ourselves blessed to be able to hear you, even in this room, even in the midst of this really, really big storm, God. And as big as it is, we know you're bigger. We love you, God. I pray that you be with Kevin and his words tonight and a small group afterwards. Thank you, God. Thanks, Jacob. Hey, Crave. I hope that you are doing well. I know this is a little bit different. Um, once again, meeting uh, not in the same location, but we are going to get through this. Um, I do want to give you some announcements. Uh, first announcement is I don't have a date for when we'll be back. Um, if I could tell you that, I would. It's not a secret I'm trying to keep from you, uh, but we're just continuing to monitor the situation. And so when we know more, we will share that with you. But uh, what I can tell you is next week, we will continue to meet live. 
Uh, and so uh, we'll be here uh, today. We are live on our Facebook page. So that's something that you can check out. Uh, you can also find us on Instagram. So Instagram, our handle is Crave Brookwood, all one word. And then if you go to Facebook and just search for Crave High School Ministry, you will find us there. If I'm not perfectly centered on your screen, it's because I've got Instagram right here on one phone and I've got Facebook on the other. Uh, and then we're also recording on the computer because if you miss this, um, you can find it tomorrow on our YouTube channel. And I would encourage you to check out our YouTube channel. Uh, it's Brookwood Students. We've got a lot of different things going up there throughout the week. Uh, I know that we've had a uh, participatory thing taking place. We've had our worship March Madness. Maybe you're a basketball person and you've been missing out on March Madness. Uh, and so we did a Sweet 16, which moved to an Elite 8. And this week we'll be moving to a Final Four. I know Jacob and Robsy have some special things planned for that. So uh, take some time, if you haven't already, to vote. I believe voting ends tonight. And then tomorrow uh, they'll be filming. And, and on Wednesday, I believe, Wednesday, uh, they'll be letting you know who's advanced to the Final Four. So check that out. Out, and that'll be good. So, uh, to the teaching, we are wrapping up our series, The Message. Uh, and so, we spent last summer going through Matthew chapter 5. We spent the first portion of this year going through Matthew chapter 6. And then, uh, when we get to November and December, we'll wrap up Matthew chapter 7. These three chapters are collectively known as the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and we believe that if you want to know what Jesus is all about, this is a great place to start. This is his longest recorded public sermon. So today we're going to be in Matthew 6. We're going to look at the last three verses. That is Matthew 6, 33 through 34. If you have missed any of these messages, I will tell you, you can find them on YouTube. Uh, and so that'll be something that you can do. Uh, I will also tell you that Jacob and I discovered something last week, which is if I hold up for you the passage we're going to be in, Matthew 6, uh, 33 through 34. It looks backwards on the screen and in fact is backwards to you. So I tried really hard this week to write all of these backwards and maybe I did a good job, maybe not. Uh, you will be the judge of that, I am sure. But uh, Matthew 6, 33 through 34, I'll let you turn there. I even got one of our Bibles from South Campus just for nostalgia's sake. Uh, while you're turning there, I'm actually going to try to adjust... A little bit here. There we go. All right, we've only got two verses to get through, but there's a lot to unpack. So let me read these to you and then we'll begin to break them down. Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Uh, love this passage, and actually I want to read to you, if I can, Matthew 6, 33, where we'll spend the bulk of our time. I want to read that to you out of the ESV. I like the way that it's phrased here. It says this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. With such a short passage, just two verses, I really just almost want to go word by word, if I can. That first word here is, is seek. Seek first. So when I think about the word seek, I think about the game hide and seek. And for me, it feels like right now we're collectively playing a game of hide and seek where all of us are hiding in our house and the person who was supposed to be coming to find us just kind of forgot and we're still there. And I don't know if that's ever happened to you. But that's what this kind of feels like to me, and that has no real spiritual bearing on this. It's just what I thought about this week as I was preparing. Uh, another thing that comes to my mind as I think about seeking, um, well, actually, Harry Potter just came into my mind because Harry was a seeker. So the third thing that comes into my mind is a U2 song. Now, probably you've heard of U2. They've been around a long, long time. Uh, and they had a song that came out right after I was born, actually, so many, many moons ago in the late 80s. But they had a song that came out called Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. Uh, and that's a lyric throughout the song. and It's repeated over and over. And this person in the song just still hasn't found what it is they are looking for. And I would tell you it's true in that song. I think it's also true in our lives. I think many of us would say, I've been looking for something and I just haven't found it. And maybe it's because we don't even know what we're looking for. We can't even articulate it. I would tell you you, if we were to unpack a lot of things from each of our lives at some base level, all of us are looking for a place to belong. We're looking for approval. We're looking for acceptance. And I think you'll see as we continue to look into these verses, what we're ultimately looking for is Jesus. All of us have been made in the image of God. 
And so there is some fundamental part of us that understands this, and we are searching to be a part of something greater than ourselves. And I think that can ultimately only be found in Christ. So we keep reading. It says, seek first. Now, last week, as we were studying in Matthew, I asked you to consider, where is your focus? Like, what are you focused on in life? And this is talking about seeking first the kingdom of God. I want to frame it for you a little bit differently this week. I want you to think about what you think about. So when you wake up in the morning, when your eyes open for the first time, what's the first thing that you think about? What comes into your mind? Then I'd ask you to think about when you go to bed at night, when you finally stop mulling over you know, everything you're looking at on your phone, and it's just you and your thoughts, what's in your mind at that point? What does your mind return to every moment in between those two, from the first thought you have in the day to the last thought you have at night? Where does your mind re- return to? What do you find yourself dwelling on? I would tell you that what dominates your thoughts is probably what's very important to you. Not just your thoughts, but where you invest your time, your energy, your effort. All of that is going to point to what's number one in your life. Now, hard question. Would you say that Jesus truly is the number one thing in your life? If I were to answer that question, honestly, I can't tell you that he is every single moment of every single day. Sometimes it's my family. Sometimes it's a hunt for toilet paper and you do what you got to do. Sometimes, if I'm honest, and probably most of the time, number one in my life is just me. My comfort, what I want, when I want it, how I want it. And the reality is Jesus is not even second on my list. He's somewhere further down, maybe even in a second tier. And I would tell you that's a scary thing to consider. I'll give you another scenario. Uh, If you were going to have maybe the most important person you could think of come over to your house. Now, I don't know who that is for you. It could be somebody in a lot of political power. It could be a sports icon or hero of yours. But if you were going to have somebody very important over to your house, would you serve them the meatloaf you had last week that's been sitting in the back of the refrigerator? Probably not, right? Like I'm talking about, it's not a couple days old. It's like, I probably should have thrown it away by now, but I just don't really want to reach in there and do it. Would you serve that very important person leftovers? Of course not, especially if you want to impress them, especially if you want them to think highly of you. And yet the reality is, I think many of us are guilty of serving God leftovers. We give him the scraps of our day. We take for ourselves first what's most important. We think, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do this. God, you can have what's left. And I would tell you, We wouldn't do that to somebody that we wanted to impress. We wouldn't do that to somebody that we care about. Why do we do that to God? I'll give you a resource to check out. I know you still have schoolwork that you're doing, but you probably have a little bit more downtime than you are accustomed to. Uh, There's a book called Crazy Love. It's by a guy named Francis Chan. He was a pastor out in California for a number of years. I believe he's um, recently departed back to somewhere in Asia to be a missionary again. Uh, and this book is, is one of the more challenging books I've ever read as I've been pursuing a relationship with Christ. And he has a chapter in here that's all about serving leftovers to a holy God. And I just want to read you a, a couple sentences here. He says this, This holy God deserves excellence, excellence, the very best I have. But something is better than nothing, we protest. Really, is it? Does anyone enjoy token praise? I know I don't. I'd rather you not say anything than compliment me out of obligation or guilt. Why would we think God is any different? Again, just this thought of we want to seek God first, not as a backup plan, not as a, oh, I had a little bit of extra time. Jesus wants us to seek him first, to seek his kingdom first. First, Now, when you hear that concept of of kingdom, I would ask you to think about what does that mean? What is the kingdom of God? It's something that you've heard talked about in church. If you are fluent in Christianese, we talk about these expressions that we throw around with regularity. But like, can you explain it? If we were all together physically in the room, you'd be like, yeah, I'm so excited we're back. But if I called you up and was like, hey, can you come explain to all of us what is the kingdom of God? Now you're probably like, okay, I'm I'm glad I'm not watching this live in the room with Kevin because it's kind of a difficult thing to explain, right? Uh, Jesus tells us a lot about the kingdom. Actually, if you look further up into Matthew chapter 6 at verse 10 as he's teaching us how to pray, he says that we should pray for God's kingdom to come and for his will to be done. Jesus talked about a kingdom 
that is near. He said it's it's at hand. It's almost here. It's almost time. Over and over and over again, he says this. He says the kingdom is forcefully advancing, but there's this tension that exists. There's an already component and there's a not yet. Already, not yet. See, we would say that God's sovereign. And so he's always been in complete control of everything. That's a fundamental belief in our faith that God is sovereign. So he's always been in control. He's always been sovereign. And then Jesus tells us after he's come, he's lived a perfect sinless life. He's died on the cross. He's risen from the dead. He says, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. So Jesus has authority. And yet the kingdom has not been fully established. Jesus has ascended into heaven. We believe he is coming back. We know this is going to happen. Go read in the book of Revelation. It'll tell you all about it. And it will paint a picture of Jesus that's very unlike most of the pictures, the actual pictures that you've probably seen. If I were to simplify it for you, I'd say that the kingdom of God is the the place where we are under the rule and the reign of Jesus. Now, I say place. It's not just a physical place. See, if I press you, you might say, well, heaven. Yes, but that's not the total answer. It's anywhere that the full rule and reign of Christ is recognized. So, he's already been in control of everything, yet he's coming back to establish his eternal kingdom. So how do we advance the kingdom? How do we seek the kingdom now? Well, we try to bring our lives more fully under the lordship of Christ. And I would ask you just to think about your life. Just think about when you look at the things that you're doing, when you look at the things you're saying, when you look at the attitude of your heart. Probably all of us, if we're honest, realize we need to have a slight attitude adjustment after these last couple weeks, right? Because our routine has been smashed. Uh, We've been forced to do some things that maybe we don't like, be at home all the time, do online school, be around my family nonstop, 24-7. And the reality is maybe we started trying to set up our own kingdom, but we're told that we should seek the kingdom of God. So what would that look like in your life? I'll ask you to consider this question. Nope, that is not it. Got it. How can I submit to Jesus? Ooh, my N is backwards. But that's okay. Pretty good for writing backwards. I think you would have to agree. How can I submit to Jesus? Here it is, if you're watching this later on YouTube. How can I submit to Jesus? We hate that word, submit. I put it side by side with the word surrender because there's something about that that makes it seem like we failed. We're beaten. We've given up. But the reality is Jesus is Lord. Not me, not you. And that's good news. It's good that I am not in charge of the universe. And as awesome as I think that you are, it's good that you're not in charge either. Jesus is Lord. So what would it look like practically for you to make that more real in your life? What's one area of your life that, if you're honest, you've held on to for yourself? You tell Jesus, hey, you can have this, you can have this, you can have this, but this, this is mine. Jesus, don't touch that. Don't change that. Don't mess with that. This is mine. What is that area for you? I don't know. I know some of the areas in my life as I've been preparing this week, as I've been thinking about, I need to bring this more fully under Jesus' authority. What is that in your life? I'll give you another song. I know we talked about you too. There's a guy named Sean Groves um, who put out some, some great music in the early 2000s. He's got a song called Welcome Home. I would recommend you go check that out. That was something I listened to when I was in high school way back in the day. Uh, But the song is all about Sean Groves is singing to Jesus and he's welcoming him to his heart. And he's talking about how he's had places that have been closed off that Jesus has not been welcomed to. And maybe you think that's kind of silly, but I think that's a good depiction of what some of us have going on in our lives. Jesus, you can have my Sundays. Jesus, you can have, you know, my church time, but the rest of this is mine. And to live fully under his lordship, to submit and surrender to him, to seek the kingdom, is to let him be in charge. Let's keep reading back in Matthew 6, uh, continuing in verse 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. Now that live righteously piece comes when we are submitting to Jesus, when we're allowing him to be in charge and not us. We think we know best, but the reality is Jesus knows what's best for us. So when we acknowledge that, when we try to live that out, that's when we'll begin to live righteously because the spirit will be leading us. He says, and you will be given everything that you need. Now, this is a reference back to the previous verses we covered last week where Jesus talks about, hey, I watch over the birds. I watch over the flowers and they're just birds and flowers. I care far more about 
you. And so Jesus says, I will take care of you. I will be with you and you will have everything you need. Now, that's a tricky thing because it's not everything we want. It's what we need. And honestly, what we think we need and what Jesus knows we need are not often exactly on the same page. And I'll just give you a spoiler. Jesus is right and we are often very wrong. So think about that uh, as you consider this verse. Now, before we jump into Matthew 6, 34, um, I do kind of want to drive home this kingdom point here for you. Um, I think we do often get focused on secondary things, and the kingdom is what matters most. So I want to hit you with kind of a cross-reference passage. This is 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Ooh, boy, that 15 looks real good. That 2 is real ugly, though. I tried really hard to write this backwards. 1 John 2, uh, 15 through 17. I'll read this to you now. It says, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but from this world. And this world is fading away. Don't miss that. That's the beginning of 1 John 2.17. This world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. We get so caught up in so many things that just don't matter that are fading away, right? Video games or popularity or money or a dating relationship or hoarding all the hand sanitizer. I don't know whatever it is in your life, but most of us, if we're honest, get caught up in things that just don't matter and won't matter in eternity. You know, what we're seeing right now in the world with COVID-19, uh, it can be a very sobering thing. And, and what my prayer has been is that it would cause all of us to confront the reality is that we're not immortal. Like we're not going to live on this world forever. All of us at some point are going to stand face to face with Jesus. And when I stand face to face with Jesus, I don't want what I lay before him to be stuff that was trivial, stuff that ultimately didn't matter. I want to be able to say, Jesus, what was most important to me was you. And I want him to say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. This has been true in your life. Come in and to be treated and greeted as a friend. I hope that you get this. The kingdom is so, so important. Don't shy away from this just because kingdom is kind of a difficult concept to unpack. Push in, do some research for yourself. Now, most of us have probably heard Matthew 6, at some point, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and he will add all these things to you. But that's not where the chapter ends. And I, I want to tell you, Matthew 6, 34, for me, has been a verse that has helped me uh, almost as much as probably any verse in the Bible. This is a verse that, that I found years back. Uh, I don't know if this ever happens to you. Sometimes you read Scripture over and over and over, and you don't see it. Like you don't see that there's something about that that maybe you've never fully grasped. And so Matthew 6, 34, for me, was that. It says, so don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Today's trouble is enough for today. Now, you can see a very clear application of that, right, for, for what's going on right now. Don't be so hyper-focused on tomorrow. Focus on today. I think that's good. For me, where this helped was I know how I think. And I don't know that this is true for you, but it might be true for somebody. I would get very focused in my walk with Christ on, on streaks, right? So I would think about... If I can go a week without cursing, right? Like that was a huge thing for me to go a week without cursing or go a month without any impure thoughts or go six months without whatever, right? I, I cared a lot about streaks. You see this in society. I don't think it's just me. Like the way some of you will go after preserving your Snapchat streaks, like you're going to be out of the country for two weeks. You're going to give someone else your login so they can make sure those things stay going. Like I got to keep that streak or this has happened to me. I want to always log into my Bible app every day. And I, somehow on a fundamental level, I'll be like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing real good in my relationship with Jesus because I've logged into the Bible app today. I haven't read it. I haven't gone through my Bible study plan or my, you know, read the Bible in a year plan, but I logged in. And so I see that and I go, streak, yeah, I'm doing so good. And I would get so focused on a streak that I would put too much hope in that streak. And so what would happen for me is I would fail. Shocking, I know. If you know me, I know you're blown away that I would ever fail at anything, but I fail all the time. And so what would happen is I would look back and go, well, I made it three weeks without whatever, and then I failed. And I would get so upset and so disappointed, I'd get so down that then I would just be more prone to continuing to sin, continuing to walk further and further away from God because I was embarrassed and I was frustrated. And so I would just walk away. 
And I don't know if that's something that you've been through before, but what I would tell you is when I saw this verse in a new light, it helped me understand. I don't need to be worried about next week. I don't need to be worried about next month, next year. I want to focus on today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Worry about today. Like you've heard the expression, not today, Satan. Yeah, like, okay, today I'm going to commit to follow Christ. Today I'm not going to give into that temptation. Today I'm going to overcome in the name of Jesus. And the enemy will begin to whisper, what about tomorrow? You know you can't keep this up. I'm not worried about tomorrow. Today I'm going to focus on today. Tomorrow, I'm sure we'll have its own troubles. Tomorrow, we'll have new developments. Tomorrow, we'll have new things coming at me I didn't even see coming. But for today, I'm going to make a choice right now to follow Christ, to submit to Him, to try to live out a kingdom mentality. That has been such a help to me. It doesn't mean I turn a blind eye to the future. It doesn't mean that I just don't think about the future or don't make plans. What it does mean is I focus on today. I try to be present today. So I would ask you to think about, last one, we'll see how this looks. What step can I take today? Okay, my N is still backwards, but again, pretty pretty good for writing backwards. What step can I take today? What step can I take today? You're at home. Maybe you're going crazy. Like, I've been at home for, uh, we, we keep magnets on the refrigerator uh, that Judah plays with, and I believe on the refrigerator it says lockdown day 13. And if I'm honest, there have been some some great days. But I'm feeling that stir craziness a little bit, the same as you. And as I'm at home and as I'm with my son, as I'm with my wife, over and over, day after day, a lot of the same things over and over, the question I want to be asking myself is, how can I live today more fully in line with the teachings of Jesus? How can I surrender and submit to his lordship today? How can I advance the kingdom? How can my thoughts, my words, my actions, my attitude, how can those things show that I'm living out a kingdom mentality? How can I live on purpose and live on mission today for Jesus that God would be glorified? Because we've talked about this many times. I'm not the point of my life. You are not the point of your life. I would even tell you your eternal destination, which we talk about so much, and I would tell you is is so good, and I celebrate and affirm that. But your eternal destination is not the ultimate point of your life. The glory of God is the ultimate point of your life. Now, choosing to surrender to him and having that eternal life and that eternal security is huge. And that's a big part of glorifying God. But if that's all that life was about, then at the moment of salvation, boom, you could be beamed up and go to heaven, right? And that'd be it. No, we're called to live out on mission, to go and make disciples, to advance the kingdom like Jesus talked about. We should pray, God, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, how are you going to glorify God? What would that look like in your life as you're dealing with your parents, as you're dealing with your siblings, as you're dealing with your neighbors? How can God use you where you are right now? I would tell you, I think we get very excited about our sports teams. So I've seen a lot of people on both sides of the fence, like there's no sports right now, right? And people are clamoring for sports like bring it back it's fine just play with no play with no fans and and for me I'm kind of detached I'm just on the sideline like I'm not a huge basketball guy or hockey or any of these things oh boy but I read this week that hey football could be in danger now if you know me you know I'm a huge Colts fan you see that I have a lot of Colts attire and anybody who meets me if you hang out with me for five minutes you probably know man this guy loves the Colts poor guy they're terrible you're right but for me I have to understand that if everyone in my life knows me as the Colts guy, and like that's the main thing they know me for, I feel like I've failed. Like it's okay to like football, it's okay to like Clemson or Carolina or Duke or whatever is your team, whatever sport. But if like that's the thing you're known for, man, I think we've missed it. And we see people getting so passionate when there is sports, right? Like in the stadiums, painted up, they've been out there all day, they're screaming, they're going hoarse. They're taking the next day off of work because they were out so late. And you just go, man, they're passionate about their team. Are we passionate about the kingdom? Are we passionate about Jesus? Do we care about that on anywhere near the same level that we care about some of these other things? I would tell you there's probably a a big attitude adjustment that all of us could make. Uh, In closing, I'll leave you with this. In Luke chapter 12, there's a parallel of what Jesus has taught through a lot of Matthew 6. And there's a verse in Luke 12, it's Luke 12, 32, that's not found here in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says this, Don't be afraid, little flock, 
for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Don't be afraid. It gives the father great happiness to give you the kingdom. So in closing, I would challenge you, don't be afraid. There's so much right now that's going on that you could choose to despair. And listen, it's okay to be sad and it's okay to mourn the loss of certain things, but our joy is not found in circumstance. Joy comes from Jesus. And so don't be afraid. Trust that he is sovereign. Remember that he is on your side. He's for you, not against you. And it's easy as you're looking at, uh, I'm missing my season. I'm missing my friends. This is maybe my senior year and this is how school is going to end for me. It doesn't mean Jesus doesn't love you. When we go through trials, it's a chance for our faith to grow. This is something that you're never going to forget. This is a time that you will remember. We're going to talk about this years from now. And this is our chance to do something special for God, not to just moan and gripe and complain, but to live on purpose for the kingdom. And it starts in your house. It could expand out into your community. The Bible talks about loving your neighbor. And we often talk about, well, that's you know somebody on your sports team or somebody in your class. And those things are true. But you're not seeing those people right now. You know who you might be seeing? Your literal neighbors who maybe you've never spoken to before. What a chance you have from a safe distance to, to strike up a conversation. Can you think of the last time you even had a faith-centered conversation? I'm not talking about you have to be like, oh, nice weather, isn't it? Do you know if you're going to heaven? Like, you don't, don't, please don't do that. That's weird. Um, but to build relationships with people and then be able to talk with them about what's important to you. I think we all do that. Think about, think about that little old lady who just always wants to show you the pictures of her grandkids, right? And she's always got a story and she's always going on and on about it. You're like, cool, I get it. You love your grandkids. Great. Man, what if we were that excited about Jesus that we're like, hey, can I just tell you what Jesus did in my life? Hey, can I just tell you a little bit more about him? Not that where we're beating people over the head with it, but where we're so excited that the joy just flows out of us. So don't be afraid. Seek the kingdom. Take a step, whatever that looks like for you today. Loving, I love you and praying for you. And I want you to know if, if you need somebody to talk to in this time, you can reach out to us. Uh, our whole team's here. Uh, we're, we're not just at home playing Xbox just because, oh, we're not coming to the office. Uh, we're still here. Uh, we're here. For, if you want to text us, call us, DM us. Um, we love you. We're praying for you through this. So I'm going to pray and then we'll close. God, uh, thank you that you loved us so much that your son Jesus came and that he uh, made eternal life available to us because of his life, death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, Jesus, I pray that if there's somebody who's watching this who doesn't have a relationship with you, they would understand that the only life that's worth living is one surrendered and submitted to your Lordship. God, I pray that you would begin to speak to them, that your Holy Spirit would begin to work on them. God, that you would be revealing yourself to them in the midst of everything that's going on with the coronavirus. God, as we're adjusting to a new reality, would you use this time in a powerful way to speak to those who are far from you? And God, for those of us who would say, we follow you, your Lord, would you help us to take stock? Would you help us to turn inside and just see honestly where we are, where our thoughts dwell, God, where our time is invested, what we're prioritizing in our life? And I pray, God, that you would help us to make adjustments, to seek your kingdom first, to make sure, God, that we're bringing every area of our life under your authority. And God, that that would flow out in our conversations and our actions with others. So send us out to be missionaries now, even in this time. We love you. Thank you so much for everything you've given us. We make this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Well, thanks for tuning in. I know we've uh, had some folks both on Facebook and Instagram, and maybe you're watching this on YouTube later. Thank you for, for tuning in. Uh, small group leaders, I know some of you have talked about doing some Zoom sessions after this with your crew, so I highly encourage you to do that. And just think through some of these questions. You know, what step can I take today? How can I submit to Jesus? You know, what are my priorities? What would it look like in my life to advance the kingdom? I think those are great questions. Parents, if you're watching this, what a great question to, to bring up with your student. Students watching this, what a great thing to be talking about with your friends or even your siblings or your families. Like, hey, how can we as a family unit advance the kingdom in the middle of all this? That's going on. So love you, praying for you, here for you. We're going to sign off for now, but stay tuned this week and we will, uh, we'll be in touch. See ya.